Okay, welcome back. So in the last tutorial, we covered how to get access and refresh tokens from the Darwin API token server. In today's implementation, we're going to expand things out a little bit. Previous tutorials were about introducing ourselves to the API, all the sub APIs, how the endpoints are structured, what kind of information you can get from the Darwin API, etc. From here onwards, we're going to project manage this a bit better and create as much object oriented behavior in our implementation as possible. In line with that, I've taken the code from the previous tutorial where we wrote uh, a get tokens function to get us access and refresh tokens using our username, password, client ID, and client secret, uh, along with the scope as well as the password flow grunt type implementation. Um, I've turned that code into a class that we can then import into future classes that we write. In terms of changes, there's a minor change here, the introduction of an init function because it's a class. And inside this init function, we're passing a credentials dictionary instead of uh, hard coding the username, password, client ID, and client secret. In terms of new things we're going to do today, the very first thing is to design and implement a superclass. And this superclass will essentially take over the effort of calling any API and associated endpoints from within any script that we write in future. So the superclass, the idea behind that is for us to subclass this in future as we write things for, say, for instance, the Darwin Info API or the Trading API, Quotes API, etc., for us to be able to subclass out of this main superclass instead of having to rewrite code and make things a bit more organized and reusable. In terms of the structure of this superclass, what I've done here is implemented the auth object inside the init function. This will read your information, your username, password, client ID, and client secret from a local credentials file that I've put inside a folder called config. A sample of that file, because the creds.cfg file contains my information, the sample, it looks like this. A username, password, client ID, and client secret. As you can see, those values are extremely secure. But this is essentially how your configuration file needs to look in order for this function to be able to accept that as a dictionary. In terms of loading um, that dictionary, we're going to read this information in key value pairs from that config, CF, uh, config CFG sample you just saw here. This will essentially turn what it reads into a dictionary, and that dictionary will then be passed on to the init function of the OAuth object. The new class that we're writing today, as I mentioned earlier, has this functionality. So the first part of the init function contains all your authorization information. The DWX OAuth2 function, the class, will read your configuration file and store your access token and refresh token as retrieved from the token API server into a, a local variable inside that class object. Uh, we'll construct the URL as per the specification on the Darwin API store page, as we saw last time. So let's go back there for a moment. Here you'll see that each API has a corresponding name and version number and the structure of the URL that we need to construct in order to then access an endpoint within that URL is api.darwinx.com forward slash, in this case, Darwin info forward slash the version number, which is 1.4. And then to this main URL, we will attach the endpoint, the particular endpoint that we'd like to access. And those are listed over here. So in terms of implementation, we need to first construct the URL with its API URL, API name and version, as we saw earlier, which is api.darwinx.com. And just for default sake, we've included Darwin Info and 1.4 here. This is equally applicable to any other API in the suite that supports GET and POSTs, POST requests. Um, we then construct our authorization header with the access token that we've retrieved through our dwx underscore oauth2 object. Going back inside that um, file for a moment, you'll notice that there's a new variable here called underscore data, and that retrieves the JSON response from the token, token server, which contains our access token, refresh token, ID token, and expiry time, as well as the scope again. It saves all of that information inside this variable called data. 
in the form of a dictionary, in the form of a JSON object. So all we then need to do when trying to retrieve the access token is to access our auth object and extract the access token key, a value for the access token key from the data variable inside that class. Attach it to the word bearer and that completes our authorization request. These headers, these headers then we need to include in any requests we make to the API server. Finally, I've also included a post headers object over here. We're not going to discuss delete requests in this tutorial. We'll do that in future tutorials as the use case comes up to send a delete request. But for now, we're implementing get and post requests in this uh, particular tutorial. Inside the post headers, we have the main authorization header that contains our bearer and access token, followed by some content type and accept um, configuration, which is application JSON. There is a function I've written for you. All of this code will be published on GitHub, of course, so feel free to peruse that in your own time. But the function essentially implements two functionalities, get and post behavior at the present time. As we discussed earlier, after constructing the main URL, we then need to attach an endpoint to it, depending on what we would like to do. So for instance, if we wanted to get the quotes of a particular Darwin, or we wanted to get all products available, all Darwins available, a list of all of them, uh, those sorts of use cases we can implement with one generic function in this case. And in future, when we develop further classes specific to, let's say, the Darwin Info API or the WebSocket API or the Trading API, et cetera, we can subclass from this class and continue our implementation instead of having to rewrite code everywhere else. Things become a lot more reusable, things remain object-oriented, a lot more cleaner and um, organized for us to uh, project manage this better. In this function call API, we have an endpoint type and data um, set of arguments. The endpoint is of course what we will extract from uh, the API store particular API in question. So in this case, for instance, we'll demo for now, we'll go through and demo how to retrieve the quotes of a Darwin, in which case we'll need to use this endpoint slash products slash product name. And that product name is the name, the ticker symbol of your Darwin, including its um, uh, digits, followed by slash history slash quotes. To do that, we need to issue a GET request. As you can see, that particular endpoint is a GET endpoint. So in order for us to do that, we need to get the endpoint. We need to assume a GET request, attach the endpoint to the main URL, attach our headers, set verification to true for the request. And once the output is received, we can we send back the JSON from that output to the calling function. The same is the case for any post requests. If we, when we do post requests in future tutorials where we try to filter Darwin's or other use cases that involve post requests, uh, we'll be doing exactly the same procedure, only the call will be to requests.post instead of requests.get because post requires a post call and delete requires a delete call, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so essentially that is the structure of this class and um, let's demonstrate how it works. So let's go into DWX API, let's run this script so it is available to us and let's create an object, let's call that API and that equals DWX API and that's it. Because I've got everything set up already, my credentials are inside the file creds.cfg, um, it includes my username, my password, client ID and client secret. The code will read this information into this environment without displaying it on screen. So it's a safe way for me to present the functionality to you right now. And for you in future too, it's, uh, even though text is not secure by any means, uh, you'll still, you still won't have your important credentials flying around the screen if you're working with them in real time. So this uh, message is displayed here that access and refresh tokens have been retrieved successfully. Uh, these were read in with my credentials. And now I can execute calls to the API. We'll, we'll demonstrate this using the Darwin Info API today. So API dot underscore call API. I'd like to get the, I'd, I'd like to do a few endpoints to demonstrate the functionality. We've already got the API URL inside and all we need to do is attach endpoints. So in this particular case, let's go back to the API documentation. I would like to get the products, the product quotes for Darwin THA, which we're using as an example here. 
and um, product quotes and a few other pieces of information such as its current D score or some other score like market correlation or something just to demonstrate how the API call API function actually works. So in this case to get the D score for this particular product Darwin will do slash products slash THA dot 4.12 which is the full ticker symbol for Darwin THA followed by DX score to get the current Darwin X score for this Darwin. It is a GET request. And after that, because it's a GET request, we don't need to send any data, so we'll leave that empty. And once we enter that, it'll return to us a value of 81.05, which is to two decimal places. On the platform, you'll see this rounded to one decimal place, rounded up to 81.1. Let's try a few more use cases. So let's go to the API documentation and see something else. Let's get scalability, historical scalability or uh, historical quotes, something to that effect. So to execute historical scalability, let's quickly copy over this um, uh, endpoint over here. And let's say THA so and so slash history slash scalability. And because this is historical scalability, this will return to us a time series that we have to post-process later. So in future tutorials, we'll go deeper into post-processing, organizing data using pandas and NumPy and other uh, use cases to that effect. This will return to us the historical scalability attribute information for this particular Darwin THA 4.12. So if we go back to THA, the information you've received just now is this information, the historical evolution of Darwin THA's scalability, which is now called capacity attribute. Same is the case for, let's say, quotes. So if we want to get the historical quotes for Darwin THA, we would simply, for now, execute a basic call to history slash quotes. Again, because this is a GET request, we don't need to send any additional data other than our authorization header, which includes our access token and the endpoint. And this returns to us Darwin THA's quotes history as a JSON object. Like I said, in future tutorials, we'll organize all of this information information into pandas objects, data frames, construct portfolios, and cool things to that effect. So don't worry about that. And that's it. So now we have uh, an OAuth class that allows us to do the necessary work to get our access and refresh tokens in real time without having to physically store our access token anywhere. We've got a configuration file functionality in here for you to conveniently place your credentials somewhere whereby uh, you can make them accessible to your script without having to type them in anywhere. Inside the DWX API class, which is a super class, we have a main call API function that can be used in future implementations we'll do specific to each sub API, whereby we can subclass this class without having to rewrite all of this code and uh, extend our implementation further. We also uh, will benefit from organizing our code in object-oriented fashion. And I've also built a sort of tree structure here, an example, of course, this is purely a suggestion uh, that organizes our effort as we go along and publish this uh, both in these videos as well as on GitHub for your convenience. So that's it for this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we'll cover uh, some additional use cases in the Darwin Info API and other APIs, particularly how to filter Darwin's by certain attributes and other use cases, how to post-process information we receive in the form of JSON output and how to use it um, in a manner that promotes time series use as opposed to simply acquiring JSON data. As always, if you enjoyed this presentation, please do consider sharing it with your social networks, colleagues, co-workers, and friends. And do subscribe to the DarwinX YouTube channel so you remain up to date with all future videos that will be released in this series and other topics discussed on DarwinX. Thank you very much for your attention. See you next time.